So I received this email from a friend who's not particularly happy with the fact that a lot of people are giving Gage way too much credit when it comes to how he would have responded if Kyle was not able to shoot him. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and read this. It's a long email, and I'm, not only, I'm only going to interject rarely just to put some commentary in. So here we go. Hello out there. I am trying to get through. With his powerful brainwaves cradled in the warmth of reasoning, it's time for Johnny Walker Dread to straighten you out on a thing or two. Emanating all the way from exciting Las Vegas, Oklahoma, it's the Johnny Walker Dread Show. Okay, here we go. I watched your video on what Gage, Huber, and Rosenbaum would have done to Kyle if he hadn't defended himself, and I pretty much agree with you on Rosenbaum and Huber. I have to, very respectfully, disagree about Gage, though. Sorry. I feel strongly about this and hate seeing people make the argument Gage wouldn't have shot Kyle when everything I've found out about him says the opposite. It downplays the amount of danger Kyle was in, even if people don't intend to it, and a lot of pro Kyles give Gage the benefit of the doubt to try and remain non-biased when it is most definitely not deserved. I don't use social media, and I have no interest in arguing with closed-minded people, so I found it cathartic to write down some of the reasons I believe what I do. While it's pointless with many people, I hope I can get across enough of what I want to say to someone like you who has an open mind and is willing to consider changing their opinion, even if ultimately you don't. The way I've written this comes across as a mix between a direct conversation with yourself and a message to the public. This is because a lot of it is arguments I've had with people, and I've tried to stitch them together as best as possible. Feel free to not read them, and no offense will be taken. When Kyle told Gage he was going to the police, Gage asked him, who's shot? Gage then dropped back so Kyle couldn't see him and called a mob to stop him as he drew a loaded gun. Gage watched as Kyle got punched in the head and beat to the ground with a skateboard while people called for him to be beaten and craniumed, shatter his skull. Gage watched Kyle try to run but drop after the sheer force of the blow from Huber hitting him in the head with the solid metal trucks of his skateboard. Gage watched Kyle on the ground, struggling to even sit up, let alone stand. Gage watched Kyle get kicked in the head by a grown man and saw that man trip on Kyle's skull as Kyle's head hit the ground. Gage watched as a mob descended on a teenager laid on his side on the ground, cowering as he was again struck in the head by the same man he had seen beat him to the ground as he was desperately fleeing to the police he told Gage he was trying to get to. Then Gage stopped watching. He raised the loaded Glock he had drawn when Kyle told him he was going to the police and he aimed it at the boy being beaten on the ground. Then Gage waited, both hands on the Glock trained on the boy on the ground. Gage didn't lower his weapon when he saw Kyle was down. He didn't lower his weapon when Huber was dragging Kyle along the ground by the rifle strapped to his body. But Gage didn't shoot either. So this is proof Gage wouldn't have shot Kyle, right? He chose not to do it now, so why would it be any different later? But did Gage choose not to shoot now? Did he choose not to shoot Kyle? Or did Gage choose not to shoot Huber? Right there in that moment, there was no clear shot. Huber was over Kyle, so the likelihood of hitting Kyle and not Huber was slim to none. So is this evidence Gage wouldn't have shot Kyle if Huber wasn't in the way? No. Is it evidence that he wouldn't? Also, no. Only Gage knows what he would have done, and it will always be that way. If he said he wouldn't have shot Kyle, he could face jail time. If he said he wouldn't have, he'd be seen as a coward like his friend called him when he visited him in the hospital. What we do know is when Gage heard a shot ring out from Kyle, he panicked. He did the only smart thing he did all night and raised his hands in surrender, cowering slightly. 
The difference is when Gage cowered, Kyle stopped. When Kyle cowered, the beating continued. Now, you've got to ask why. Why did Kyle stop when a five foot eleven man with a Glock in his hand was towering over him? Kyle was sitting at Gage's feet, beat up, in pain, scared, alone, and vulnerable. People say Kyle should have submitted to the mob, but he didn't. He fought back and defended his life against multiple attackers, but not Gage. Kyle submitted to Gage. He lowered his gun and aimed it down and away from Gage. He dropped eye contact and looked away from Gage. He stayed at his feet. He didn't try to get up, move towards Gage, or ask him to move away from him. While Gage was standing over him, Kyle didn't even attempt to brandish at the mob still surrounding him. Now, these are all good points. Yet Gage was arguably the biggest threat of all the mob that night. He was armed, and he was right on top of Kyle, so Kyle had nowhere to run. By this point, Kyle knew the police weren't coming to his aid. Nobody was. That's a really good point to make. Earlier in the night, Kyle made a statement to journalist Richie McGinnis. EMTs aren't coming, so it's up to us citizens to help each other. Kyle knew the police weren't coming to save him, and he knew EMTs wouldn't come even if he was dying in the street. The only way Kyle could have been more vulnerable is if Huber had succeeded in taking his gun. So why did he stop defending himself when faced with the biggest threat of the night? Good question. I think it's because Kyle made the biggest mistake he made all night and it's a mistake people are still repeating now. Gage wasn't going to shoot Kyle. There's three perspectives to consider here. Kyle's, Gage's, the public's. You can't know any for certain, but you can look at the information available and make an informed consideration based on what we do know. Let's start with Kyle. Kyle went from defending himself from a violent mob to leaving himself vulnerable to one of its armed members. Why? Because he didn't think Gage was a threat. At the least, he thought Gage wouldn't hurt him. At the most, he thought Gage would protect him. This sounds like conjecture, and again, we'll never know for sure, but look at what we do know. Gage had been around Kyle all night. He'd been recording him like McGinnis and Elijah Schaefer had, and we saw Kyle felt safe with McGinnis even after Rosenbaum had chased him down and Zeminski had shot at him, in Kyle's mind. Kyle also trusted Ryan Balch, and Gage had been talking to Balch earlier in the night. If Balch trusted Gage then, to Kyle, he could trust him too. There's another point to be noted here. Kyle knew Gage's voice. He'd heard what he sounded like from Gage's conversation with Balch, so he knew who he'd spoken to when he told Gage he was going to the police. So when the attack finally stopped, the mob had parted and Kyle looked up, he saw Gage, his hands up like, I'm not a threat. He saw a guy he was safe with, who we recognized, who knew he wasn't trying to hurt anyone because he had told him he was trying to get to the police. The police who Kyle trusted and respected, who he wanted to be one if he didn't become a paramedic. A paramedic like the guy standing over him wearing a paramedic's hat. In the Antioch interview, Kyle said he knew the paramedics personally. So we can't read Kyle's mind, but we do know some of what he thinks. Kyle thinks paramedics are there to help, not hurt. And Kyle had no reason to believe the guy in front of him in paramedic's hat is any different. But Gage wasn't the paramedic Kyle thought he was. Did that almost cost him his life? Let's look at Gage's perspective and ask the same thing. If we can't read his mind, then what evidence is available to see what he might have done? Gage spoke to Kyle. He'd seen how Kyle had acted all night, watched him offering medical to anyone he passed. Gage felt safe enough with Kyle to run to the muzzle side of his gun while people yelled Kyle had just shot someone. He listened to Kyle tell him he was going to the police. We already covered Gage seeing Kyle getting beaten, and we know he could see why Kyle had fired each round, so we can skip to the point where Kyle is at Gage's feet, eyes down, gun pointed down and away. 
Gage's hands in the air in surrender. Right now, Gage has the upper hand. Kyle's on the ground, trapped. Gage is up and mobile. Kyle is injured and has already been beaten to the ground. Gage's sole exertion was running Kyle down. Kyle is alone. Gage has the backing of a mob that has Kyle surrounded and who Gage knows are willing and wanting to hurt Kyle. Gage is in the position of power while Kyle is weak. So what did Gage do? He had a choice here, and whereas Kyle had a split second to decide whether to pull the trigger each time he was attacked, Gage had the luxury of more time to think. The threat to Gage was not imminent. Kyle was showing no signs of aggression and every sign of someone trying to disengage from the situation. He had already spoken to Kyle and knew Kyle was trying to get to the police. He ran right up to him while he was open carrying as a baying mob bore down on him while Kyle was under immense pressure and fear. And Kyle did nothing to Gage. Now he was in the same situation. Gage had run right up to an armed, frightened Kyle, and Kyle responded to him in the same way as before, by doing nothing. So if Kyle responded the same way to Gage in both instances, why didn't Gage do the same? Can we reasonably say why there's a difference in Gage here than before? Why didn't Gage talk to Kyle this time? Ask him to go to the police like he said he was trying to do. Tell him don't shoot anyone. Ask him to drop the gun or tell the mob to back off. Why didn't Gage respond the same to Kyle this time as he did before? Because he did. Both times Gage approached Kyle. Both times Kyle responded passively. Both times Gage chose not to call the mob off of Kyle so he could get to the police. And both times Gage pulled a loaded gun on a passive teen. Looking from Gage's perspective, is there an argument for why Gage wouldn't have shot Kyle? What are the public's arguments for why Gage wouldn't have shot Kyle? And this is kind of the one that, you know, we have to kind of look at very carefully. There seems to be two main arguments people have for why Gage wouldn't have shot Kyle. One is mind reading. Simply, Gage wouldn't have wanted to shoot Kyle. The other is the assumption Gage had the opportunity but didn't take it, so that proves he wasn't going to do it. Now, I'm kind of concerned that this might be a fallacy of limited options, because I, I could see some maybe some other arguments here what we read on. Yet the facts, while imperfect, lean in the other direction. Gage wouldn't have shot Kyle, but didn't get the chance. Let's look at the factors we know. Gage would have shot Kyle, but didn't get the chance. Let's look at the factors we know. Gage dropped back and pulled his gun as Kyle fled. Gage called for a mob to stop Kyle, getting to the police he could see he was heading towards. Gage watched Kyle get beaten. Gage aimed a loaded gun at Kyle, but had no clear shot while he was being beaten. Gage made no attempt to stop the attack on Kyle. Gage moved to Kyle's blind spot before lunging with his loaded gun. Gage pointed a loaded gun at Kyle again. Kyle was quicker. There was nothing Gage could achieve by his actions if his intent was good. Calls to stop him getting to the police, lunging with a gun, aiming a loaded Glock at Kyle, no verbal commands, instructions, reassurances. Which of these suggest Gage was performing a citizen's arrest? Which say Gage wasn't going to shoot? Maybe the gun to Kyle's head or the stop him when Kyle said he was going to the police? So what about the reverse of this? Is there evidence to suggest the public are mistaken that Gage would have shot Kyle given the chance? While the past doesn't speak for the present, patterns of behavior can become evident. There's a reason courts often allow character witnesses. Well, in a criminal case, character witnesses during a trial, you know, I don't know if witnesses are called up to give character testimony, but uh, I'm not a trial expert, so I couldn't tell you. So who is Gage? 
What do we know about him that could suggest, not definitively, whether he'd have shot Kyle? Okay, so I have another video on Gage's past criminal activity. Um, a lot of the stuff that's coming up here is stuff I can't really verify. I'll go ahead and show the pages of the email so that you can look at it and comment. I don't want to read it out loud, though, because until I actually can verify this content, I'd rather not broadcast it that clearly. Uh, so what I'm going to show you is now something that, that a person wrote to me about. I, under no circumstances am I saying that it's all accurate. It very well could be. And a lot of it is because I covered it in a previous video. So it begins, people underestimate Gage. And I'm going to go ahead and just show you the pages from this point on. Go ahead and stop the video to read it if you want. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pick back up on it here. But all that's in the past. So to fit the narrative, many discount patterns of behavior, not individual acts, which would be fair to discount, but a lifetime of repeated actions. So for these people, let's focus entirely on that night and Gage's actions for his intent. Gage claims he's a paramedic, and he's dealt with multiple gunshot wounds, yet when he heard someone was shot, what did he do? I've listened to every bit of audio I can find and haven't heard anyone say Kyle killed anyone while Gage was present. So why didn't the paramedic go help the gunshot victim? Why did he leave a man to die while he drew his weapon and chased someone who told him they were going to the police that were right in front of him? No matter what the circumstances, have you ever seen a paramedic leave a patient lying on the ground while they chase someone who may or may not have injured them. For all Gage knew, he could have saved Rosenbaum's life that night. Even if he believed Kyle was an active shooter, he didn't, there were plenty of others, some also armed, to deal with Kyle, yet only Gage, who could treat a gunshot victim. Why did Gage leave a man to die to join a mob who already had Kyle outnumbered and outgunned? While people may not like to bring up people's past, there's a point where it's too relevant to discount. After Kyle told Gage he was going to the police, Gage asked him who he had shot. Gage came with 24 of his associates, so there's a good chance Kyle had shot one of them. Throughout his past, Gage had repeatedly shown himself to be violent and have a quick temper. You can also consider the repercussions to weigh up Gage's actions. Huber was called a hero for beating Kyle to the ground and trying to disarm him and leave him defenseless against the mob. I think the mob genuinely saw Huber's actions as heroic, as they wanted Kyle and he put his life on the line trying to give him to them. The reason Kenosha DAs and politicians are doing what they're doing to Kyle is they wanted the mob to get Kyle as much as the mob did. They don't want people protecting property, defending themselves and their community. Kyle defending himself and his community encourages others to do the same. If the mob had severely beaten or killed Kyle, nobody would have dared defy the mob for fear they would get the same. As he survived relatively unscathed, they're having to punish him in court to put the same fear into people. You have to ask the question, what if Kyle had died? He was labeled a racist mass shooter, so his killers would receive the same accolades they're getting now. Once Kyle had shot Rosenbaum, Gage had nothing to lose by killing Kyle. If he succeeded, he'd be the hero who stopped a mass murderer. If he failed, the mob or the courts would finish what he'd started, and he'd still get kudos for trying. Gage knew he wouldn't have repercussions from a legal standpoint, as the politicians and DAs were happy to let the rioters destroy the city without punishment. They didn't want people interfering, and seeing someone die would have achieved that goal. I can guarantee nobody in power would have touched Gage if he'd killed Kyle. You can see this in the Sequoia Turner case. 
Now, I'm not going to go into that. Um, I'm not aware of it, and I'd rather just go ahead and skip over it. And I'm going to go ahead and also skip over the uh, references to Aaron J. Danielson. Look at how emboldened criminals have become in some of these cities. There's daily murders, and the police are either standing down, quitting, or running scared. Unlike Huber and Rosenbaum, Gage knows how to hide what he is and alter his behavior according to the situation. He can turn on the tears for a TV interview, then be threatening cops a few hours later. Reconsider whether Gage would have shot Kyle. I'll go ahead and let this soak in, and maybe I'll reconsider. But the question I have to ask myself is, what if it was all my own family's finances on the line here? In other words, suppose I had to pony up, bet everything I had on whether Gage would have shot Kyle or not. Where would I put my money? I mean, yeah, I, I get how people can look at this situation and think, well, Gage would have shot Kyle. But if you have to put up your life savings on the outcome, all the bias kind of disappears. And in that situation, I'm not so sure how I'd respond. Like my video, subscribe to my channel.